my interests have been um, in trafficking, so in molecular mechanisms of membrane trafficking, and I'm now going to tell you about molecular mechanisms of um, autophagosome formation. And as Francesca already alluded to, um, the one of the reasons why it's become really important to try to understand the basic process of autophagy, not just what happens in disease, um, is because we need to start to intervene and manipulate the process um, under conditions where it's both a pro-survival pathway and a pro-death pathway. So it's a very complicated um, pathway, and we really need to understand in complete detail the mechanisms in order to understand what's going to happen if we manipulate it. And this, I've chosen this slide because I didn't want to pick the paradigm of cancer because it's confusing, but also to illustrate that it's not just involved in cancer. So it's involved in, in at many different um, organ levels, which are shown here. It's involved in um, the pancreas. So it's involved in diabetes. Um, it suppresses um, the, um, the, the effects that you have when you get insulin resistance with high fat diet. Um, and it keeps the, the, um, both the adipocytes and the pancreas healthier. Um, but it's more importantly involved in suppressing inflammation when you have um, liver disease, which can lead to tumorigenesis. But also when you have infection, it suppresses the effects of um, uh, infection of, for example, the gut, um, which um, causes inflammation, Crohn's disease, and tumorigenesis. So in addition to cancer, it also has a really important um, role in many different organs in the, in the body and at many different levels. So the process itself, so what we study is, is um, macro autophagy, which is a non-selective sequestration of material. So autophagy is a lysosome-mediated degradation pathway. So autophagy is self-eating. And what happens at, um, in many different um, uh, types of um, pathways, which I'll explain in a little bit of detail, is that cytosolic material becomes sequestered by this double membrane structure, which we call a phagophore. It then, this phagophore grows and closes, and I'll go through this a little bit in more detail, um, with the cytosolic material remaining inside. You then get delivery of um, hydrolytic enzymes, um, which are in the lysosome, which degrade this sequestered material. And you have the return of the sequestered material into the cytosol, so the degradation of the products, amino acids, lipids, all sorts of small molecules. And this refuels the cell. Um, to um, ensure continued protein synthesis, energy production, and gluconeogenesis. So this pathway is most easily understood when you amino acid starve cells. So the cells don't have any nutrients. They can't undergo protein synthesis because they have no precursors. So they don't have any amino acids, and this pathway is upregulated. And that's the, the, that's the scenario under which we study this pathway. And you also have other types of autophagy, so microautophagy, which is similar. It involves the lysosome, but you have a direct delivery of the cytoplasmic material, sometimes bound to a chaperone, directly into the lysosome. And this is called microautophagy. This is very understudied in mammalian cells. It's only really well understood in yeast cells. And then you have a completely different type of autophagy, which you could argue isn't really autophagy except for the commonality of the lysosome, which is called chaperone-mediated autophagy, where again you have a, a chaperone bound to a substrate. This substrate is unfolded and then delivered across the membrane of the lysosome using the LAMP2A as a, essentially as a transporter, um, and then this substrate's degraded. And there, this has been well characterized by Anne-Marie Cuervo. So you have these three types of pathways which broadly fall into the description of autophagy. So as I've said, the, the process that we study is the non-selective um, macroautophagy. And I'm, gonna, I'm not sure my movie's not starting. Okay. Oh. There. Okay. And what happens in a uh, rat hepatocyte, for example, when you amino acid starve, is you get the production of all these autophagosomes. So at the beginning of the movie, the, the cell was essentially had a diffuse green fluorescence. When we amino acid starve the, the cells, we get all these vesicles, which are labeled by this protein LC3, um, tagged with GFP. So you see within 15 minutes a rapid induction of the. So this is an unstarved cell um, that was just starved. So this is actually what most people call autophagy. So it's non-selective. It's assumed to be random. So proximity-based sequestration of cytosolic proteins, vesicles, and organelles. And it's used under basal conditions and during nutrient deprivation. So under basal conditions, it's very important to maintain good housekeeping of the cell. So the idea under basal conditions is that it identifies misfolded proteins and it identifies damaged organelles and removes them. And most of those um, removal events would be considered selective pathways. So this again is another movie. So what you have here is a red mitochondria, um, which is labeled by an a, a, a autophagy adapter called optineurin. And you have it 
it's damaged, so it's being sequestered by delivery of LC3, so autophagosome positive membranes, which engulf and surround this damaged mitochondria and remove it. So this process is called mitophagy. There's also pexophagy, which is removal of damaged peroxisomes, xenophagy, which is removal of bacteria, and this requires these autophagy receptors, of which one is called optineuron. And these autophagy receptors have a small motif in them, which binds LC3, and then they have a, usually a larger domain, which binds the cargo. So the cargo in this case would be the mitochondria, and it's usually, and now we know, understand very well, it's through ubiquitin, that the um, uh, autophagy um, receptor is binding to the mitochondria and to the LC3 and allowing sequestration of this damaged mitochondria into the um, autophagosome and degradation in the lysosome. So in more detail, at a molecular level, uh, there's three important compartments that are required for the formation of these double membrane structures. So this was one of the first electron micrograph um, that was um, uh, shown to, uh, in, in mammalian cells. It was very well understood in yeast by then what, what genes were required through um, genetic screens. So we had a list of 18 or so genes in yeast in 1992, which we knew were required for autophagy, but in mammalian cells it was very understudied and very under, um, uh, ver not very well understood. But what we did know from a lot of EM data, and this EM data even goes back to the 50s, is that when you starve cells, and this is a rat hepatocyte, you see these dense osmophilic membranes which um, if the preservation was better, you would see are two actual, two bilayers separated by a space, which grow in uh, starved cells and then start to curve under, um, under mechanisms which still are not well understood and start to close. Mm -hmm. And the formation of these membranes, it, it, we believe now, happens on domains of the endoplasmic reticulum, which are called omegasomes, and are driven by vesicular trafficking of membranes from a compartment which is positive for the transmembrane protein A2G9, which is an autophagy protein. So in yeast, all the autophagy proteins were labeled A2G proteins. Um, and it's also driven by vesicular trafficking from the Golgi complex. So you need the ER, the Golgi, and a compartment which is derived from the Golgi complex to start the formation of these double membrane um, structures. So they start to grow and close, and then they um, undergo uh, closure, so they, um, the ends fuse, so it's like a saucer on a teacup becoming a football, um, and the mechanism of this, is, again, as I said, is, is unknown. And what you see when you initially look at an autophagosome is that it's eaten the material in the cytosol, and essentially what's inside looks the same as what's outside. So this is an immature autophagosome that's just closed. You also need, at this point, you need extra membrane, because this is a membrane-intensive um, process which comes from the recycling endosome. So during endocytosis, you use the recycling endosome to traffic um, receptors. But during um, autophagy, some of this membrane is also diverted to this compartment. The acquisition of the proteins from the endocytic compartment also probably aid in um, the delivery of this vesicle to the lysosome, because what happens next is that you get fusion of this double membrane autophagosome with the lysosome, multifesicular bodies. And when you have delivery of the lysosome by fusion with the outer membrane, you start to degrade the inner membrane and you end up with a single um, membrane um, autolysosome, which is shown here. So this is, the, this is essentially the pathway that we're talking about. So the proteins that I will um, start to describe in more detail um, were originally identified in a yeast genetic screen. Originally there was 18. Um, there's now over 40. Um, there are only about 18 that are required in mammalian cells, and I'll try to um, talk you through some of them as, um, by way of introduction. And what I'll be actually focusing on is this initial stage um, and this domain of the endoplasmic reticulum, we call the omegasome, and I'll show you why we call it that um, uh, structure. So recently, the EM, quality of the EMs has vastly improved, and what um, uh, two labs, Avalisa Esklinen and Tomatsu Yoshimori, did in um, really nice um, tomography um, and serial section experiments is try to understand this dense membrane, which I showed you before. And what they realized is it's actually wedged between two cisterna of the endoplasmic reticulum, which is shown here. So here again, you're starting to see a more closed membrane. Here the structures are closed, and here it's finally closed. And what you see is that there's a cisterna of the ER um, usually sequestered by this autophagosome, and usually the ER that's on the, um, the outside um, dissociates. But what Nick Kostakis' lab shown, uh, showed quite early on is that this process does, form on the, uh, does occur on the endoplasmic reticulum. This is the ER labeled in blue. Um, can everybody see the slides with that light? Is it okay? Okay so, okay, so this is the ER shown in blue, 
Um, this is the, uh, the marker that I showed you before that was labeled with GFP. It's now labeled with red. So this is the LC3 protein, which is the autophagy-specific protein. And this is a protein that's not required for autophagy, but recognizes a pool of um, phosphatidyl, phosphatidyl 3 phosphate, PI3P, that's produced on the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and this is called DFCP1. So when you starve cells, this is amino acid starvation over minutes, 33 minutes into starvation. What you see is you see these PI3P rich domains occurring on the uh, endoplasmic reticulum that's shown better here. Um, these ring-like structures, so here's the blue ER, the green um, PI3P effector, the LC3, and what you see is an extrusion of the LC3 positive membrane from these domains of the, um, of the ER. So this is the birth of the phagophore and the autophagosome um, in live cell imaging. So I, I think you can appreciate the complexity of this pathway and how, um, how basically how little we understand about how these membranes form, but what an amazing um, process it is that you actually can form these double membrane structures um, in cells. So um, I'll just walk you through the, now the proteins, and then I'll concentrate on two small stories um, that we've recently published um, about um, trying to further our understanding of the process. So I've now drawn the platform of the endoplasmic reticulum um, with the omegasome structure, which is labeled by, uh, which we identified um, through Nick's work labeled with PI3P. And what we think is we think this is, has a different lipid composition, and we don't know what the lipid composition is, but we can tell by the way that we've done the electron microscopy is that it stains with osmium. So osmium is a dense osmo it, it's a dense precipitate that you use in transmission electron microscopy that binds lipids. So it looks different. It's stained. This region is darker than the endoplasmic reticulum, and therefore we think that it's a different lipid composition, but no one's been able to identify what lipid composition is there. But what we do know from the yeast genetic screen is that there's these 18 proteins that are required for mammalian autophagy. There's the ATG9, which is the only membrane-spanning protein of these 18, which is pretty amazing because it's a vesicular trafficking event. It's the only true membrane protein of these 18. There's a protein kinase complex, which is called the ULK1 complex. Again, this is largely um, a sort of an unknown complex. We don't understand the substrates of this kinase yet. There's a lipid kinase complex, which produces this PI3P on this unique domain. And these are all multi-subunit complexes composed of different ATG proteins. These all are, have ATG names, but they also um, have um, other names that um, were derived historically. Um, and then um, you have uh, the, the beginning of the pathway. So ATG, the, um, our data and data from several other labs would suggest that delivery of vesicles or delivery of membrane mediated by this ATG9 protein that was found in this compartment initiates the process. Then you have recruitment of the protein kinase, um, phosphorylation of the subunits of the protein kinase, and presumably substrates on this membrane which are not yet identified. Then you have recruitment of the PI3 kinase complex on Becklin-1, and this is all under amino acid starvation, which produces this pool of PI3P. So this is a unique pool of PI3P. It's not recognized by effectors of the endosomal PI3P. So it's, uh, it's somehow in a different context. So proteins like EEA1, which would be on the early endosome, don't recognize um, this PI3P under starvation conditions. So it's, in a, it's presented in a unique com uh, context. So this, this PI3P is recognized by uh, an, a true autophagy protein called WIPI2, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, what the function of WIPI2 is. It's also recognized by the DFCP1 protein, which isn't required for autophagy. And then also what happens next, so you have the PI3P effectors binding, the DFCP1, which isn't required, but marks the membranes, and the WIPI2, which is required. You get and then get the machinery that starts to drive the lipidation of the LC3 and the GABA wraps. And I'll explain to you why these are important. And these are the markers that most people that study the process um, use to investigate autophagy. So um, they're all members of the ATG8 family, which is the single yeast protein um, that performs this function. So these proteins become lipidated, and that lipidation is driven by um, these uh, ubiquitin-like conjugation complexes. Um, in particular, ATG3 um, is the final um, E2-like protein that delivers the LC3 um, to the PE, which is found on this membrane. So you have a lipidation of LC3, association of LC3 with the membrane, and that's what you saw in the first video. So you saw the soluble cytosolic protein translocating to the membrane, and the reason it was translocating to the membrane is because it was becoming lipidated. So it was um, covalently associated with the head group of the PE. So that's how you get the production of the, um, 
these membranes, and this again is, is what's happening here. So you have the PI3P recognized by the DFCP1, the LC3 lipidated and being concentrated in these structures, and then the formation of the autophagosomes. Okay, so the reason that the LC3 family is important, so originally it was A2G8, and there's a single one in yeast, and what happens is this A2G8 protein gets cleaved by a cysteine protease, it gets acted on by an E1 and an E2-like um, enzyme, so you have conjugation of the E1, then you have uh, conjugation of the E3, which allows the covalent coupling of the PE to the A2G8. So in yeast, everything is performed by this one protein, A2G8, but in mammalians, there are actually two different families, and each family has three members. So it makes it very complicated um, to study um, this process. But we think these proteins are essential for fusion of vesicles to this um, phagophore, um, and also closure. And there's some evidence in the literature suggests that they fall into these two different um, uh, functions. So that LC3, the LC3 family acts early um, to bind to the membrane and mediate fusion of vesicles. The GABARAP family acts later to allow fission to occur between these two ends to allow closure of the membrane. It's also important to realize that when you close your autophagosome, all the LC3 and GABARAP falls off the outside and you only have the LC3 left in the inside. So what you're in the movies, what you're seeing is you're actually seeing vesicles which are probably closed, which have the LC3 on the inside. Um, and this is a very um, transient state and not very abundant. So as I said, I have, I'll address two questions. So what I've, I guess you're already aware that I'm interested in the PI3P and we've studied it a lot. So we wanted to know what the function of this unique PI3P pool was um, dur during autophagy. And we knew that the WIPI proteins were effectors. So we knew that the WIPI proteins bound the PI3P. But when we first started these studies, we had no idea what the purpose of a PI3P effector was in this pathway. So why was it there and what was it doing? And what I'm going to show you is that the function of the WIPI proteins is to recruit the LC3 to the region of the ER, which is enriched in um, PI3P to allow growth of the phagophore. So just to remind you, the WIPI proteins are the PI3P effectors. So we knew that. In humans, uh, there's four um, proteins, um, so they're called WIPI1 to WIPI4. Uh, the WIPI stands for WD repeat proteins interacting with phosphoinositides, and they were first discovered by Tsula proizak Suzanne and actually um, Peter Parker in, um, at, um, in my institute um, also found them based on homology with um, yeast proteins that bind PI3P. So they're um, WD fold, um, as the name would suggest, seven beta barrel propeller um, domain containing proteins and they're members of this family called propins. So um, one of the um, family members, WIPI4, which actually does act in this pathway, and I won't explain to you what its function is, it acts downstream of WIPI2, um, WIPI4. So this is the first evidence in humans, actually, that mutations of an autophagy gene cause disease. And actually, mutations in this WIPI4 protein call, cause a very se severe neuro neurodegeneration in humans. It's a very rare disease, but it's a, extremely severe, and the patients die around 20. So the, this is actually surprisingly, considering how many proteins there are and how many um, studies there are, this is the first evidence um, for um, the role of autophagy in a, a human disease um, that's not um, sort of inferred. WIPI2 we're interested in because it was the mammalian homolog of the ATG8 prote ATG18 protein, which was the autophagy gene discovered in yeast. So because there was uh, four proteins, we had actually started look, looking at WIPI1 and WIPI2, so because these were the ones that were most likely to be the um, ATG18 homologs. And the first experiment we did was to do a mass spec pull down with the two proteins tagged with GFP and uh, look at the interactors. And what we saw immediately is that the, the WIPI1 and the WIPI2 interact with different um, proteins. And interestingly, the WIPI2 acts, interacts with ATG5 and 16. And I'll explain a little bit more about what these are because it went quite fast. Um, but what's important to realize is that these families, as I said, they're WD propeller. They have seven beta propellers. The WIPI3 and the WIPI4 are slightly shorter, but the domain structure is identical. This is the PI3P binding motif. And the difference between the WIPI1 and the WIPI2, there's four isoforms of, of WIPI2, um, um, is very little. Um, they have a similar domain, but in fact, there's a single um, insert um, present in one of the um, WIPI2 species which isn't present in WIPI1A and isn't present in some of the WIPI2B um, isoforms. Despite this um, similarity, there's a slight difference at the amino terminus, and obviously there's amino acid differences. They bind totally different um, proteins. So we were most interested by the A to G512-16 um, interaction, and this is the, the Western blots which confirm WIPI1 interacts with beta-COP, which is part of the Codimer subunit, and WIPI2 interacts with A to G512-16. 
um, and that's shown here with, um, by Western blotting with endogenous proteins. So we were most intrigued by um, this um, uh, result, and we've sort of left this to the side. So what is WIPI2? So WIPI2, as you would expect, because it was an ATG protein, the knockdown of the, of the protein inhibits autophagy. So you're looking at stably transfected HEC293A cells, which express GFPLC3. So in a fed condition, um, the, with WIPI2, you essentially see very little, because this protein is, is cytosolic. Um, it's, um, it's not very um, abundant, so you don't see a diffuse red fluorescence. But when you stain cells, um, and maybe I'll turn off the lights so you can see the red, if it's not too dark. Is it okay? You can see it a little bit better. What you see in the WIPI2 um, cells is uh, you see um, these vesicles formed, which um, largely co-localize, but not completely co-localize with LC3. If you knock down WIPI2, you see an inhibition of LC3 puncta, and that's quantified here. So WIPI2 is required for the production of these GFP LC3 um, proteins. As I told you, it's a PI3P effector. So if you inhibit the production of the PI3 using a drug called wortmanin, um, you see a decrease in the, the um, WIPI2 puncta. So the result that you have uh, a diffuse cytosolic protein, which suddenly becomes concentrated on uh, the LC3 membrane, suggests it translocates from the cytosol um, to the um, site of the forming autophagosomes. And we think that's largely true, but we also think that there's a big pool of the protein bound on the endoplasmic reticulum, <coughs> which is, is hard to detect in these sort of conditions. And, and when you starve cells, it becomes clustered. And we have some evidence for that, which is shown here. Within 15 minutes of amino acid starvation, um, what you see are these, these punctate structures of WIPI2 on the endoplasmic reticulum. And we have some biochemistry, which shows that, in fact, before amino acid starvation, the WIPI2 is largely membrane-associated, and then it just forms these puncta when you produce the, the PI3P under amino acid starvation. So the protein, the WD40 um, propeller domain commanding protein forms, we think, oligomers when you starve the cells. So we could also then, we followed up the interaction of HEG5-1216, um, which, um, as you might recall from the slide, is, the, uh, is an E3 complex, which catalyzes the lipidation of um, LC32. So this suggested that there was a direct link between PI3P binding WIPI2 and LC3 um, lipidation through this um, ubiquitin-like conjugation complex, which drives um, the lipidation of um, LC3. So we could see a co-localization of HG12 and HG16 in uh, GFP LC3 um, uh, expressing cells stained with WIPI2 here in blue. So you see some co-localization of HG16 with WIPI2, which in fact is better than the co-localization with um, LC3. Um, so again here, this is HG12. So that suggests that this complex is co-localizes more often than these two complexes. We could also do immunoprecipitation, which was challenging with the endogenous proteins, and we had to actually cross-link the lysate in order to see a stable association of the 51216 with the WIPI2, but when we use increasing amounts of crosslinker um, immunoprecipitating um, uh, the proteins, we can see um, immunoprecipitating WIPI2, we can see HG16 um, being pulled down and HG512. So then we wanted to try to understand the interaction between HG16 and WIPI2, and the reason that we thought it was HG16 was because of the, the data from the mass spec where we had more peptides from HG16 than HG5. Um, and so we started to look a little bit at this HG16 protein. So in humans, there's actually two HG16 proteins. They're very similar. HG16 L2 is slightly shorter. They have this domain that binds HG5 because it's part of the HG5-1216 complex. It has an oligomerization domain. Um, and it also has a domain which um, is required for LC3 puncta formation, and that was shown um, by this lab. So the region between 229 and 242 um, in um, HG16 L1 is required for LC32 puncta, but it's not required in HG16 L2. So using domain swapping where you take HG16 L2 and you put the L1 domain in, you can rescue puncta, but if you just have HG16 um, L2, you don't have LC3 puncta. It also binds to FIP200, which is a, another story. So we knew that the um, L1, HD16L1, was able to drive the lipidation of LC3, and we knew that the HD16L2 wasn't, and we knew that this region between uh, 229 and, um, uh, actually this small region, 229 and 242, um, was required for LC3 puncta. And what we also knew is that 
this region was very, it was, had a very different charge in the L1 compared to the L2. So you have a, a lot of acidic residues in the L1, where you have a mix of um, basic and neutral residues in the L2. So what the student did in the lab was to mutate each acidic residue um, individually in the L1 um, protein, and that's shown down here. And using gfp wipi 2 we did a GFP trap, and we discovered that two of the residues in this um, charge domain, um, uh, when you mutated them from an acidic residue to a basic residue, lost the binding of HEG16 L1. So this was actually the domain of HEG16, which directly, we think, interacted with um, WIPI2, and that's quantified here. So um, this was done in collaboration with a structural biologist who modeled um, the domain between 208 and 242, which is shown here, and this is HG16 L1. And he could show that these two acidic residues, which we, we um, found were uh, um, responsible for interaction with WIPI2, um, were at the end of a, a helical domain right before a proline-induced turn. So they were likely to be accessible um, in the complex, even if it was bound to HG512. Um, so these two residues are required. So these two acidic residues are required for HE16L1 to bind um, to WIPI2. Um, so then um, concurrently with that, we were looking at the different WIPI2 isoforms. We were also looking at WIPI1. And we were trying to confirm that, in fact, um, whether or not WIPI1 bound to HG16 and whether or not there were any differences between these WIPI2 isoforms, which I, as I, I would remind you, um, WIPI2A has this insert and WIPI2B doesn't. We also know from work of Tisula proizac sazan that WIPI2A and WIPI2C couldn't rescue uh, um, autophagy if they were expressed in cells, whereas WIPI2B and WIPI2, sorry, this should be, um, no, that's right, WIPI2D um, could rescue. And using our um, pull-down experiments, we could also show that the A protein didn't bind 16, but the B did. And the difference, obviously, is this insert. And what's important in this insert, as you probably would start to guess, are these um, charged residues. So um, this is the crystal structure of the WIPI2, um, which is predicted based on the yeast protein. So we don't know the human crystal structure. But what we could see is that this insert, which is here, um, is adjacent to a, a basic um, sulfate binding pocket. So there's some charged um, residues here that are in the crystal structure of the yeast protein are um, binding sulfate. There's also a cleft here between blades two and three of the beta propeller. Um, which are adjacent to this um, loop, so it's not very clear in this, um, this structure, but this loop actually um, uh, is overlaying this cleft between um, blade two and blade three of the WD um, domain containing protein. So um, taking the advice of the um, structural biologist, we started to look at the residues in this cleft, and we identified um, two basic residues, arginine 125 um, and arginine 108, and this is the loop that's present in the, the non-autophagy protein, um, which were adjacent to this loop. So we mutated these two residues individually, the arginine 108 and the arginine um, 125, and using in vitro translated um, HG16 to prevent also the 512 um, association, we could show that we could lose um, precipitation of the HG16 um, by these mutants. And that's, um, uh, that's quantified. It's not quantified, but... What we could also show is that the, uh, the production of LC32 in knockdown and rescue experiments, so if we express, um, if we knock down WIPI2 and express the wild type, we drive LC3 lipidation. If we knock down WIPI2 and we express the mutant, we inhibit. And the same thing with the cargo um, assays. So if you uh, measure um, degradation of cargo, you see in um, fed cells, um, you get a decrease in P62, which is um, lessened when you knock down uh, when you, so in the, um, the P62 degradation is increased when you express the WIPI2, but not the GFP. Um, and when you express the mutant of the WIPI2, which can't bind HG16, you see a massive accumulation of P62. So the conclusion from these experiments were that the arginine 125 and um, 108 are required for WIPI2 binding. So we then did a quite complicated experiment, which I won't go through in detail, but we did a charge change experiment. So we postulated that there was a basic patch in WIPI2 an acidic patch in HG16 that were mediating binding of these two proteins, so we switched them. So essentially we made the HG16 have the basic patch and the WIPI2 have the acidic patch and asked if we could rescue. And this we thought would also tell us which residues were directly binding. So it is a complicated experiment, I won't take you through it, but these are the mutations that we made. So changing basic to acidic and changing acidic to basic and expressing these proteins and asking if we can rescue um, binding. And this is the most informative panel, so looking at the mutant of WIPI2, at the arginine 108, 
and now we're expressing different HG16s which have the charge change. And what you see in the quantification is that when you change, if you have a, an acidic uh, WIPI2 and you change this, basi this acidic residue in HG16 to a basic residue, you can essentially rescue the binding of uh, a wild type, so normal HG16 um, to arginine 108 um, with this mutation. So this tells us, in a, a, again, a model that the arginine uh, 108, which is here, is directly interacting with the arginine 230. So this is, we think, is the molecular interaction between uh, WIPI2 and HG16, and the single uh, amino acid interaction might also explain why the interaction is so transient and why we had to use cross-linking um, to discover this. So now to answer the question, what we think is that the WIPI2 directs the LC3 lipidation. So this is very important for driving the phagophore formation. You want the LC3 to go to the right place so it can capture vesicles and so it can um, close the phagophore. And if you have the PI3P there, the WIPI recognizes it and then interacts with the, with the E3 complex to allow recruitment of the um, E2, which is involved in lipidation, HG3, to the PE and then lipidation. And this just goes on and on until you have a, a f an omegasome and a phagophore that's decorated by LC3. And um, this LC3 will then allow recruitment of the cargo and effectors, and that's actually what happens. Um, that's the, the function of autophagy. So now the second story I'm going to tell you about is not um, concerning the function of an autophagy gene, but concerns our interest in understanding how the whole process is regulated. So we reason that there is these 18 proteins, but there must be a massive amount of other proteins that are involved in this pathway. So um, to address this, a number of years ago, we did a, an SI genome screen, which was image-based. So we had our nice cell line that was stably expressing GFP-LC3, um, uh, which when you starved, um, the cells um, uh, showed the appearance of these fluorescent puncta. So we could use a solomics microscope to measure this effect. So you um, knock down genes, you starve the cells, and then you count the puncta. It's a pretty much as simple as that. Um, we used a Dharmacon SI genome library um, targeting all of the human um, genes. We did it in triplicate in 96 well plates. So this was essentially to discover proteins that were regulating this pathway. We also did the assay in the presence of a lysosome protease inhibitor because we didn't want um, to find targets that were involved in the final step, the maturation step because these might also affect the endocytic pathway. So we just wanted um, hits or targets that were in the initial pathway. So we use the lysosome protease inhibitor. So this is the outline of the screen, and these are um, the results. And what you see in these three columns are the three different parameters we measured when we did the screen. So the first one is the number of spots. This is the intensity of the spots, and this is the size of the spots. And what you see at the top are negative regulators, and at the bottom, positive regulators. So each column is an individual siRNA. So our initial screen was done with a mix of four siRNAs. To validate the screen, you do a deconvolution step, which is that you take every single siRNA in the pool, and you ask whether or not it reproduced the original phenotype. The more siRNAs in the pool that reproduce the phenotype, the better the hit. So what we ended up with was this protein called WAC, which we had never heard of, and which um, sort of was a, a big puzzle. Um, and very few actually autophagy genes. In this assay, the best candidate, uh, the best hit is the ULK1 complex, and it's about number 60. Um, if when you go to HG9, it's at 600. So this assay doesn't really read, read nicely read out the HG proteins, and that's probably because of the efficacy of the siRNAs knockdown. So what we're looking for now, and what the assay is actually biased for, is a, is a target that has a very robust pool of siRNAs. So th essentially, all of the siRNAs inhibited the production of LC3 spots, um, and that's what's shown here. There's other proteins here, but we've, we've concentrated on this. So this was a puzzle when the students started working on it because there was a little bit known about the protein. So WAC stands for uh, WW and coil-coil domain containing protein because it has a small WW motif, it has a coil-coil domain, and it has a putative nuclear export signal. And what was known in 2011 when we started this project is that it was in the nucleus, because the, um, the data with the antibodies to the endogenous protein, which are, 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 um, have va been validated, um, shows that the protein is localized in the nucleus, but also in this uh, juxtanuclear patch, which is the Golgi complex. So there was two different papers, one implicating the protein in Golgi reformation after mitosis and involving uh, the P97 ATPase complex and a deubiquitination of the Golgi fragments to make a new Golgi. 
And the other was uh, an implicating uh, the protein and nuclear function, actually in an epigenetic modification. And this is where the WW domain binds the phosphorylated RNase polymerase II. The coil coil domain um, binds this RNF4020 E3 ligase, which promotes ubiquitination of histone H2B, and that's where you get the epigenetic modification. So we could very well validate um, the role of WAC in the nucleus, the binding of RNF4020, um, and the role of, uh, uh, of um, histone ubiquitination. So um, this was easy to validate. This was more difficult. And what we decided to do, actually, is to ask the question of what the function of WAC was in autophagy. From the data that was published, we had no idea. And the answer will be, well, and I'll show you the data, is to mediate trafficking of one of the LC3 family members, GABARAP, between the Golgi complex and the centrosome. And we think this is to sustain the signaling of the autophagosome pathway. So it's a regulator, so it increases LC3 spots by regulating a signal, not by actually uh, mediating uh, expansion of the membranes. But this sustained signaling drives the growth of the phagophore. So um, essentially, when we started the project, we had a number of assays that we use when we um, characterize proteins involving autophagy, because there's a defined pathway. You have OLF1 activation when mTOR is inhibited. So this is when you take away amino acids. So this is um, under starvation conditions. Uh, so ES is the, uh, the starvation conditions. You inactivate TOR. You, um, uh, you uh, uh, dephosphorylate ULK1 at the TOR um, site and you activate this complex. And you can read this out by looking at uh, loss of the serine 57, um, 757 from the ULK1, so under starvation, you see a decrease in the phosphorylation. You can also read it out by looking at activation of HG13 phosphorylation, which is the substrate of ULK1, so this is phosphorylated when mTOR is inactivated. And what you see with the WAC protein is that you see no effect on the 757, but actually you see a modulation of the HG13 phosphorylation. So we knew that mTOR was normally inactivated because you see a dephosphorylation of the ULK, um, but we didn't think that ULK was activated as well as it could be. And based on that, we did a number of other downstream assays. So I told you already about HG9 trafficking. We know that HG9 trafficking requires the ULK1 complex. If you knock down ULK1, so this is HG9. In fed cells, you have a juxtanuclear uh, disposition of HG9 in the cell. Um, when you uh, starve them, you see a diffuse um, uh, dispersion of HG9. And this was also shown by Elena this morning in her very nice um, PhD thesis defense um, that I came um, to um, here. Um, when you knock down ULK1, you see uh, juxtanuclear accumulation of HG9 um, in the Golgi complex. So this is knocking down the kinase. So it looks different from risk free. You see a, a sustained co localization of HG9 with the Golgi complex, which is shown here which is lost in starvation. And when you knock down WAC, you have the same phenotype as the OLK. So you would, you would place WAC at a similar position to the OLK complex. And this was also validated by other assays. So looking at the PI3P effector I told you about, you have a decreased number of spots. You see decreased lipidation of LC3, and you see impaired cargo degradation. So I won't go through all these experiments, just to, uh, for it to say that this allowed us to place um, WAC quite high up in the pathway. And this, is, this was also one of the puzzles. So what was it doing um, to the ULK1 complex, essentially? So we then did our own immunoprecipitation mass spec experiment and identified a Golgi protein called GM130 as the best interactor with WAC. So here we have a variety of different IPs. We have a back-tagged um, cell line where GFP WAC is expressed um, as a single copy. We can immunoprecipitate um, GM130. Um, also RNF4020 complex here. This is both an endogenous IP of WAC and GM130, um, and this is also an IP of WAC, endogenous IP of WAC and GM130 under starvation conditions, where you see a very minor increase in the interaction of uh, uh, GM130 with WAC. Um, WAC does localize with GM130, so this is the nuclear pool of WAC. This is the Golgi-associated pool. Um, it it co-localizes with early Golgi markers, but not with late Golgi markers. So this placed WAC on the, um, on the Golgi membranes as well as in the nucleus. So we then wanted to map the interaction of WAC with GM130 to try to understand more about the, the biology. And we did that by um, doing truncations at both the N-terminal and the C-terminal. And what we found is that there's a 10 amino acid stretch of the, GM1, um, of, the, sorry, of the WAC protein that interacts with GM130. And that's shown here between 610 and 620. If you take out these 10 amino acids, you lose the interaction. We could show this um, by doing a GFP pull down 
with the proteins that um, are missing this 10 amino acids and contain these 10 amino acids, you see that GM130 is pulled down um, by the, uh, by the um, WAC protein, and this is the input for GM130. We purified the two proteins and again showed when we cut off this coil-coil domain, we lost interaction of WAC with the GM130. But most important, we wanted to show that this interaction of WAC with GM130 was required for autophagy. So there's no point in the two proteins interacting if they actually didn't deliver a, a functional um, effect. And we did that by knockdown and rescue experiments. So we knocked down the WAC, and we rescued either with vector or with GFP WAC. And we could show that the LC3 lipidation that was decreased in uh, the WAC knockdown, so this is in the presence of starvation with a lysosome protease blocker, so that the LC3-2 decrease in lipidation in the absence of WAC was rescued when we transfected the full length WAC, but not rescued when we, trans when we rescued with the WAC that had been, uh, the coil coil had been deleted. So this is the western blot, and this is actually counting spots. So again, it's the same thing. You knock down WAC. Um, when you retransfect the vector, you see the inhibition of the LC3 puncta formation. When you transfect in the wild type, you see a rescue. And when you take away this coil coil domain or the 10 amino acids, you don't rescue. So we knew that the interaction of WAC and GM130 was required for autophagy. So then we started to ask, OK, what about GM130 and autophagy? So we knew that the Golgi changes a little bit when you starve cells. Um, and it's very difficult to quantify. And in different cells, it does different things. But when we starve cells, what we noticed is that we saw a juxtaposition of this LC3 family member GABARAP with the GM130 in starve cells. But we also saw some co-localization in FED. It was a very small amount of co-localization. But what you typically see is you see the Golgi complex surrounding um, this uh, large structure in the cells, and you see uh, LC3 or GABARAP positive, sorry, autophagosomes um, in this region. So we um, then asked whether or not the GM130 um, directly interacted with GABARAP, and we looked at all of the LC3 family members, the A2G8 family members. So there's the three LC3s and the three GABARAPs, and we did pull down of uh, the tagged um, A2G8 proteins and looked at GM130 and also looked at WAC. So what you see is that the, uh, the GABARAP protein, which is shown here, um, which best co-localizes with the Golgi, was the best interactor with GM130 in the pull-down. We also confirmed this with endogenous protein. So if we immunoprecipitated GABARAP, which is shown down here, we could also see an immunoprecipitation of the GM130 and less with WAC. And what we did in subsequent experiments was to show that the GABARAP and the GM130 directly interact. And WAC is interacting with the complex through GM130. So we were a bit puzzled. My student was a bit puzzled about this large blob. And what he went on to, um, so he pursued it. And what he could show in um, experiments, which he did very quickly, because he said it's a large blob near the Golgi complex, near the nucleus. It must be the centrosome. So he stained cells with gamma tubulin. And in, in fact, he could see a very large reservoir of this ATG8 protein on the centrosome, which was really unexpected. I mean, people have been looking at these proteins for over 10 years and never really noticed it, because when you starve cells, you get spots. So it looks like a big spot. So nobody really ever paid attention to a spot. But we could see the tubulin positive structure in many different cell lines. So sometimes it's a bit bigger, sometimes it's a bit smaller. And it was just fortuitous that we're using the hex cells where the spot was, in fact, so large. It co-localizes with a marker of the centrosome, so of the pericentrosomal region, um, uh, centrin 3. So we were really intrigued by this uh, GABARAP uh, accumulation on the centrosome. And what we could also show, this is, again, GM130 and um, GABARAP co-localization in fed and starved cells. So you see the um, GABARAP. You can't really see it well here on the centrosome in this Golgi region. And we asked what the relationship of, of WAC. So we know WAC binds to the GM130, and GABARAP is recruited. So we asked, what was the function of WAC in this association? And what happens when you knock down WAC is, and essentially, you see a dispersion of the, the GABARAP from these punctate structures which are both centrosomes and autophagosomes, because these are starved cells, and an accumulation on the Golgi complex. So this was a direct evidence that the WAC protein, which we found in the screen, was modulating GABARAP trafficking. And this suggested this was the uh, reason that we saw WAC as one of the best um, hits in our screen. So again, we could do immunoprecipitation and show that when we knocked down WAC, we saw an increased association of uh, GABARAP with GM130, which is shown here. So the, um, so the loss of WAC causes dissociation of GABARAP from the centrosome and increased GM130-GABARAP interaction and inhibition of autophagy. 
So we wanted to then ask whether or not this pool of GABA wrap on the centrosome was in fact dynamic. So is it doing anything, is it contributing anything to the process of autophagy? So what Justin did was to generate a construct of GABA wrap that was fused to a photoconvertible fusion protein called EOS. So what this protein does is it changes from red, so sorry, from green to red when you um, photoconvert it with a 4 or 5 laser. So Justin first looked at the, the protein that he made in expression systems and showed, in fact, that it still localizes with the centrosome, shown by the um, tubulin um, co-localization, and also that when you starve cells that it co-localized with the WIPI2 protein, which is um, shown here. So you see, you see the EOS GABA wrap, so the tag didn't interfere with the normal function of the protein. It went to autophagosomes labeled by WIPI2, and it also stayed on the um, gamma tubulin um, positive um, centrosome. So what Justin next did was to do a live cell imaging experiment where he photoconverted the pool of GABA wrap on the centrosome with a 4 or 5 nanometer laser under amino acid starvation conditions and asked what happened to it. So if it was contributing to autophagy, we would expect it to move away. So here you have a cell expressing the GFP, um, uh, sorry, the EOS GABA wrap. These um, structures are, are likely to be autophagosomes because the cells are starved. This is the centrosomal pool. So Justin could focus the laser on a very nicely on this um, centrosomal pool. So you see the photoactivation of the, uh, of the protein. It turns to red. And what you see, it went very quickly. And maybe I'll start it again, because I didn't expect it to go so quickly. What you see is the appearance of the red vesicles in the cytosol. And these red vesicles in the cytosol are autophagosomes. So these are stills from the movie. So you photoconvert it, it goes red, and suddenly you see these red vesicles. And the reason that we know they're autophagosomes is because then Justin fixed the cover slip that he had just photoconverted, found the region that he had photoactivated, which um, is here, which is here. So this is the after the photoconversion, so you're losing the red, but you still have um, some green protein here, which is here. It's hard to see. He fixed them and then labeled them for, with antibodies to LC3, so another member of the ATG8 family, and could show that the red protein was indeed found on autophagosomes. So the photoconverted pool in the centrosome moved to existing autophagosomes, but also formed its own um, autophagosomes, and that's um, also quantified here. So then we asked what happens with WAC knockdown. So I showed you how all the GABA wrap goes from the centrosome to the Golgi when we knock down WAC. So Justin did the same thing. Here, the EOS GABA wrap is in a juxtanuclear compartment. He photoconverted by flashing the laser around um, the cell to activate this one and this one, and then did a time-lapse study. And what you see over 20 minutes is that this GABA wrap protein doesn't move. So knocking down the WAC protein stabilizes the GABA wrap that used to be on the centrosome on the Golgi and uh, inhibits the autophagy process. We knew it was the Golgi because he did the same thing. He fixed the cover slip, found the, uh, the cells that he had photoconverted, labeled with GM130 and showed that this EOS GABA wrap, which was turned to red, was in fact on the Golgi complex. So how does this relate actually to uh, the, the process of autophagy? And it's a, this is a slightly complex um, uh, story, which I'll try to go through um, relatively quickly because I realize I'm running out of time. But I told you already that there's two family members. There's the GABA wrap and the LC3. And I also started to describe the role of these proteins in sequestering cargo. So there's now two known functions for these um, um, LC3 GABA wrap proteins. One is as an autophagy receptor, so it's binding cargo uh, and sequestering this cargo for degradation, so something like P62, but also other things, mitochondria, bacteria, protein aggregates. And the, uh, the, L the, um, the, uh, the autophagy receptor, so this would be P62, has the Lear motif, which binds the LC3. So this is really the canonical pathway. And this is what the LC3 binding um, motif looks like um, on LC3B. So you have this short peptide. That's the Lear motif, which is found in these autophagy receptors. But what was also discovered um, only about three or four years ago is that these Lear motifs, which, bind, which, which modulate binding of the autophagy receptor to the LC3, so the Lear motifs, are also found, in fact, in many of the autophagy proteins, so the UOK1 complex, the PI3B um, complex, these proteins also have Lear motifs, so they also can either recruit LC3 or be recruited by LC3 to these membranes. And then many of the family members do. So the, the core machinery, in fact, can also bind LC3 and either recruit LC3 or be recruited by LC3. And this was really a puzzle, because why would you then start this whole cycle again by recruiting the initial kinase? And we think 
This is part of the way that the autophagosome forms, so the sustained signaling. And this is what we think all, um, sorry, WAC is actually doing. It can also, these, um, you also have other proteins which bind microtubules or bind um, to uh, uh, pathogens that allow um, binding to LC3. So these are um, uh, also called autophagy adapters. So this FICO protein has a Lear motif which binds LC3 and translocates autophagosomes on microtubules. Okay, I'm going to skip this because <coughs> basically I already explained to you that WAC uh, impairs um, ALK activation. So then we looked at the, the LC3 family members, and uh, as I said before, the, the ALK activation is mediated by phosphorylation of, or is read out by phosphorylation of ATG13. And what we could see is that the, if you knock down the ATG8 family members, which we've done here and we've shown by PCR that they're knocked down, you see the, the, the really only significant effect on ALK activation occurs when you knock down GABARAP. So, um, we knew from the experiments I showed in the previous slide, which I didn't go over, that when you knock down WAC, you decrease ALK activation. And so we asked whether or not we saw the same phenotype when we knocked down GABARAP. So if that makes sense, we would expect if they're in the same pathway to have the same phenotype. And indeed, we did see a diminution of HG13 phosphorylation pretty much only with the GABARAP, which is shown here. So then we asked this centrosomal pool of GABARAP is likely not to be lipidated because it hasn't been subjected to the lipidation machinery. And we also knew that it had the, ulk, that the, um, the GABARAP, uh, we also postulated that the GABARAP could be bound to the autophagosomes in a non-lipidated form dependent on the Lear motif. And that's the experiment we showed here. So what we asked was whether or not the activation of ALK by the GABARAP depends on the Lear motif in ALK1, which would bind the GABARAP, and the lipidation of GABARAP. So this is a complicated co-transfection experiment, but what you just need to know is that when you take away the LC3 binding motif in ULK1, you can't recruit ULK1 to GABARAP anymore. So that would explain why the ALK isn't activated um, when you remove GABARAP. So this is actually downstream of the whole initiation process. So um, I'll essentially skip the rest of the slides and show you the model. So what I've shown you for um, WAC, so the answer to question two is that the function of WAC which is not an autophagy protein, but a regulatory protein. So all the effects that you see are also not like the effects you see with an HG protein. This is a modulation of the pathway. That WAC controls this delivery of this GABARAP protein to the phagophore. So WAC is sitting on the GM130. The GM130 is binding the GABARAP. We think there's a dynamic exchange between the Golgi pool of GABARAP and the centrosome. So this is the centrosomal pool. We believe that the GABARAP is moving out of the centrosomal area on microtubules when you starve cells. You form the phagophore, you get delivery of GABARAP to the phagophore, and then you could get recruitment of the ULK1, which is downstream of this really initial events where you're making the phagophore an activation of the ULK1 complex and driving again the pathway. So you're br bringing in a kinase that was required at the initial step later on when the membranes are already formed to sustain the formation of this autophagosome. So WAC controls the delivery of the GABARAP from the Golgi to the centrosome, increasing so that the, um, the presence of WAC displaces the GABARAP, increases the pool of GABARAP at the centrosome, drives it to the autophagosome, um, and then it, we think it may selectively recruit these effectors, so the ULK1, to sustain ULK1 activation, read out by phosphorylation of HE13, and sustain um, the completion of the autophagosome. So that's just shown here in boxes. <coughs> and then it just remains for me to thank um, Justin, who was the student who did the WAC story, um, this is my lab. We're funded by uh, the Francis Crick Institute, some Mar Marie Curie funding the uh, pharmaceutical company, and thanks to my collaborators. And then just very briefly, I'm at the Francis Crick Institute, which isn't open yet. I'm still at the old institute where um, uh, Claudio also was, um, surprisingly. <laughs> so we overlapped at two places in our career. This is the new institute. This is St. Pancreas, which is where the Eurostar is. It's opening in uh, mid-2016, so in May. And they're starting to recruit junior group leaders in November. And there'll be a sum total of 1,500 people in this lab. There'll be 120 labs. And it is going to be a massive institute. And it's one of the biggest research institutes in Europe. And it's funded by all the um, key players in uh, British science. And I'll take questions now. Thank you very much. Sorry about the PowerPoint. <laughs>